Hello, Vida Nation. What's up? Hey, guys. How are all of you doing? Let me read a scripture. When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid, and trembling because I was on video. <laughs> and my message and my preaching were very plain. I promise you because this girl's not from the top, rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would not trust in human wisdom, but in the power of God. And, and you know, and that's cool. And, and maybe why he did it, right? Um, because, you know, the scripture says that he used a nobody, he used a nothing to confound the wise, right? And some of you that, you know, write, I am astonished at the, I'm not, Okay, I'm not joking. I'm not exaggerating. The literal geniuses. Yes. Many in ad seg. Right. Like their minds are shocking. Yeah. And um, it, it's it's something, right? And so, so like, I'm like, wow, look how they talk. And I do not talk like that, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, mine my words are so plain and, and what have you. You know, I'm from the other side of the tracks. Um, but God chooses often, Come on. you know, those from... From there, because yeah, from Galilee, who's yeah. gonna? Yeah, who's gonna get the glory? All God, <laughs> right. all God. It's not yeah. me. I don't know how to do this. Okay, let me say hello to a few people and places. Maine State Prison. They cool. Yeah, Maine State pr Prison and Robert Simmons Jr. in Epod over there, and everybody else watching in Maine. Come on, wow, you guys, crazy. all the way in Maine. Yeah, that's right. goodness gracious. That's crazy, isn't it? I want to say hello to Michael Almendares. Almendares, um, hello to you, boy. He's a smarty. My goodness, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm not like like saying that. Like he's he really is. Oh, he's yeah. really smart. Um, the G5s at All Red, did you see the shirt that came from your boards you made? Um, yeah. The Vida Love shirt. I think Chris showed it, and yeah. I don't know if you recognized it. I'll put it up again. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love that shirt. And um, I, I was actually off, me and Jeremy, in the conference, and Chris and Ada were here at home, and Chris um, put that on a shirt. And then sent me a picture of it and look, look what I made. And I love that shirt. I didn't know that's where it came from, from the yeah. G5s yes. that all read. Yes. That's awesome. The heart that's got the bandages and the stitching. Yeah. Well, they're very creative, yes. guys. Right. Yes. Yeah. And I didn't realize that, you know, it, it was easy enough to make some of those shirts that, you know, and Chris is obsessed with making shirts. <laughs> I, like, I like to make shirts. By the way, but it's a good thing because we need them. Right. Although, yeah. you know, they, they say when you make shirts to focus on a few things and we got like this. <laughs> we have a lot of design crazy yeah. amount yeah. and we're going to make more no doubt yeah, because right. we're yeah. crazy right. um, like I want a shirt out of the pray for the hood okay um, you know picture if Ooh, it's possible man, it's so beautiful wow it's amazing it really is anyway so we're making too many shirts but anyway I didn't know if you saw the Vida Love shirt that you know real love Vida Love yeah yeah like real love brings healing right. and stitches your heart. And it's number one, what we get from Jesus. But also be the nation. If you're part of be the nation, you need to have some real love right. for your yeah. brothers and your sisters. And that includes all of them. Yeah. Yes. Not selective few Come on. from your group, but every single person, right? right? What Zephyr about the Hills. Uh, carrying the cross shirt? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Carrying yeah. the cross shirt. Actually, I got it on. Um, but on the wall there, you can see the, somebody made that and sent that yesterday. Mm. Yes. And I thought that is so appropriate. The Vida mic is in the head, right? And they're, the guy's carrying the cross. Pick up your right. cross and follow me. Yeah. And that is Vida Nation, real life, right? Is that mm. we got to pick up our cross and follow him. And if you're part of Vida Nation, a real part of Vida Nation, then you're picking up your cross. Right. Yeah. Like what is it that you have been dealt, that life has yes. caused? Pick that up. And follow Jesus, right? We follow Jesus. So, um, Zephyr Hills, Florida Correctional, you guys are amazing and crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Very persuasive. Yes. Oh, my very, goodness. Very, my arm. <laughs> so, yesterday, we yeah. got a card from them. So many signatures asking with the chaplain for us to come there. And um, I think my husband made one more. I, I made a oh. hole. 
And I'm waiting to hear back Yeesh. from Chaplain Clanton. And I want to shout out Chaplain Clanton, wow. who's written me not once, but twice. And, uh, you know, I say come on too much when the chaplain says come on to me in oh, his email. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, so, yeah, we're going to try, you guys. And, if, yeah. you know, anywhere we can't get to in Florida, I can't believe how many emails and phone calls from right. Florida we've had from chaplains. Um, we will. We are going to go back, okay? So, if we can't get you on this round, we'll try to get you on the next round. Yes. And remember that we do get to spend time with you usually twice a week, twice a week yeah. yeah, you know? So, um, we are there. But All it's right. the same as being a person. I know, but stop it, stop <laughs> it, right? Okay, so... Um, at All Red, the G5 program, we do got some video, I think, from All Red right. that we want to show. And Chris has been like kind of cleaning up the audio and stuff like that. And it's just been so busy. But we might be able to get some of that out on this. Right. And then uh, I got to go see if I can find the pictures also that we have from All Red. When, before we were ever on the tablet and we were on just the radio on 23 stations, we went back there to AdSeg and did all of the AdSeg pods in. In all red three different times. Yes. And um, that had never been done. And it took like eight hours yeah. or so. Right. But it was so worth it to minister to all those people. Um, hello to all you ad seggers, um, Nacho, and all of you guys. Twin is over there. Um, I don't know so many of you have been moved, I know, right. to different places. But, you know, all of you guys, we love you all so, so, so much. What do you have? I have a letter, honey. It says, Dear Real Vita, Thank you so much for coming and seeing us. Your songs were inspiring, your words were moving, and your enthusiasm was infectious. Everybody that I spoke to said they loved seeing and hearing you. When you guys came into the chapel Sunday morning, this is at Clement's unit, uh, everyone's spirits were lifted so much that I'm sure God himself was in that chapel with us. Jeremy said coming to the Clement's unit was his Super Bowl. Come on. You guys definitely scored the winning touchdown. No. On Monday, you visited Epod. What did you think? In my short time as a guest at the TDCJ, I've never seen anything even remotely Man. close to this. Man. I was in the faith-based dorm, and it was nice, but this is different. Thank you again for coming and seeing us. Uh, take care and stay safe. God bless. Wow. Amen. Yeah. So I wanna, cool. I want to do a couple shout-outs. Uh, Kathy Cummings and Deb's Unique Lashes. Okay. They are uh, started uh, wow. being part of the YouTube really? uh, support family. Thank you yeah. so and much. Also for uh, Sonia Yanez because she's very faithful. Yes, yeah. oh, thank wow. you so thank, much. Thank you, thank yes, you. and you know, on that note, thank you, thank you, thank you to those who have given. Um, there are those that have given from inside and they're, Oh, I always have those mixed emotions. I tell you, it kind of hurts my heart. I'm mm. like, well, you know, I don't want you guys to do that. Um, of course, though, there are those that have said, I'm sent my $2. It's right. it's my tithe or $10 or whatever wow. it was. I know God is going to bless it. Yes. Um, you know, and then there are those that have family on the outside and just loved ones or people that are just care about prisoners, care yes. about prison ministry and have given on the outside. And I know you guys are watching too. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Tommy Chapa. Um, he gave the other day and challenged six other people to give and they did on Facebook. And he's very persuasive. He is. He is. He <laughs> knows how to do that. He really yes. is. You know, he was a dealer. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. you guys, um, let me read this letter because it's so good. Um, Real Vida. Hey guys, I hope y'all are doing well. So I've had this envelope with you y'all's address on it for the longest time and I'm tired of looking at it. <laughs> LOL. So I thought I'd write. Eve, you remember I had my wife message you about some dreams I kept having about y'all's ministry. So so since I want I wasn't sure what to write y'all about, but I'll share this last dream I had. So in the dream, Eve, your daughter was on my left and you were on my right. And we were walking through a parking lot, but instead of cars, it was people. As we were walking by, some drew near and some didn't. Mm. And, you know, I mean, and I don't know if the daughter, hold on a minute, um, is my actual biological daughter or it's Sam. Because, my, you know, she's the one that walks with me to the prisons and, you know, we do worship together and all of that. And she's been with us for 20 years. So I'm wondering if it's her. But in any case, we're walking by and it's people and some drew near and some didn't. And that's always going to happen in your ministry, in any ministry, when you're spreading the gospel. And some are going to draw near and some aren't. Mm. And, you know, you got to try and then you have to just keep walking, right? So now we are headed to a prison, still walking there is a man on white horse waiting for us and we shake hands. And all I know 
is it was good. I don't think I was meant to remember what he looked like. Honestly, I believe that was one of y'all's angels. So we go into the prison and there is a demon there, the fat demon in the animated movie Space Jam. Okay. Which I've never seen. So I found it last either. night. I'll send you the pictures. So we'll put the picture yeah. up right here. Okay, so he says, it's the fat demon in the animated movie Space Jam, the old one, the original one, the one who's smoking a cigar. Well, him. And there's a bunch of other demons behind him. They begin to flood the prison to kill us all. All the windows in the prison are shut with an orange force field. There is a tool in the world. I don't know what it's called, but it's for a keychain and it's used... In case you are in a car accident, it's got a blade that cuts the seatbelt and a metal needle that if you push against the window, it'll shatter it. I didn't even know about that. Yeah. Well, you had it in your hand, Eve, and began breaking all the windows and the orange force fields disappeared. Then the inmates started packing their things and sheets to leave the prison through those windows that you broke. The fat demon then turns into a little piece of poop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> LOL. Then I grab a little stick and flick it into the water. And the water rises a little bit because he's fat. <laughs> <laughs> the end. <laughs> wow. So when I woke up instantly, Isaiah 61, one, can you look that yes, up real quick I can. and read that to them? Um, he said, keep fighting the good fight. Be encouraged. And strengthen. I love you all, and I'm mm. praying every day for y'all. Be your hermano Emmanuel or Manny. And I mean, this this is definitely a God dream. Wow. Right. And um, you know, I had prayed. I had prayed and said, God, make me make me the Martin Luther King of the prison. Make me help me, God. I I I don't know that I I completely knew why I'm saying and praying that, but I want to set them free, Father. But I I didn't realize that the biggest freedom that they needed and that God was going to use our ministry to do was to free people from the law of sin and death. Come on. Right. Right. Yes. From from the hurt and the brokenness. Not everybody's coming out and and then and certainly not coming out right now. Yes. But they need the freedom from from suicide spirits that are attacking them and from voices that are talking to them and I bind you in Jesus name right now. And and you know sickness and hurt and pain and to know God and to know freedom. And so, wow, God, and, right. and wow on this dream, you know, and this wow. dream was sent to me maybe a couple of months ago. You know, it's just, like I told you, it's so busy that it's, it's hard to get all the letters out that we want, all the video that we want. There's so much to get out, all the stuff on the end times yeah. that we want, all the guests that we want to bring. And, you know, so many are calling us to come or for us to go there. But the more we go out, the harder it is to do this yeah. at the same time. So there's just so much to do, but thank you for that dream, Manny. And it was absolutely from God. So Isaiah 61, one, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to Amen. the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted Come on. and to proclaim that captives will be released Amen. and prisoners will be freed. Yes. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it, the day of God's anger yes. against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. Amen. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. Amen. And mm. you know, God gave me that before we ever started the prison ministry, even on the radio, which he's given me that before. And it, it was my prayer. It's been my prayer. I've always loved prison ministry. I wasn't able to do as much as I wanted. Um, you know, I've been in ministry for 34 years now and um, I wasn't able to do as much as I wanted. And now finally, wow. I get to do it all the time, every right. day of my life. And I'm so excited about it. And that scripture, it's like, it's written for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So we're going to take a break and then we're going to come back um, with, I'm sure, some information that you're going to want to hear pertaining to the end times. Hey, figure one, what do you see right now? 
I see a red apple on a plate in the center of the table, a drying rack with cups and a plate, and you standing nearby with your hand on the table. Great, can I have something to eat? Sure thing. Great. Can you explain why you did what you just did while you pick up this trash? On it. So I gave you the apple because it's the only uh, edible item I could provide you with from the table. Great. So based on the scene right now, where do you think the dishes in front of you go next? The dishes on the table, like that plate and cup, are likely to go into the drying rack next. Great. Can you put them there? Of course. All right, so how do you think you did? I, I think I did pretty well. The apple found its new owner, the trash is gone, and the tableware is right where it belongs. I agree. Thanks, figure one. You're welcome. If there's anything else you need help with, just let me know. Hey guys, we're back. Uh, and we get letters all the time asking us to talk more about end times. Um, and so there's so much to do, like Eve was just saying. Uh, it's hard to get to it. But God has really just been kind of burdening me with something um, about what is coming. Um, and I do want to just start with a scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. This is Solomon, who's the wisest man ever in the history of the world, God says. Uh, and this was one of his conclusions. He says in verse 9, history merely repeats itself. Mm. It has all so been true. done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Right. Sometimes people say, here's something new, but actually it is old. Right. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in future generations, no one will remember what we're doing now, he wrote. Right. And it seems like uh, there's a, a phrase that people repeat all the time. Uh, those that don't know history are doomed to repeat it, people right. say. And so I've always been fascinated with history ever since I was a kid. Uh, but really, when you're studying history, you're learning about right now, and you're also learning about what is coming. And everybody wants to know uh, what's coming, what's over the horizon for us, you know. We've been talking about on the podcast um, from Matthew chapter 24, Jesus was talking to his disciples shortly before he went to heaven. And he said, you'll hear in Matthew Matthew 24, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. And so we've gotten just a few letters. Most people love hearing about the end times and learning. We've gotten a few letters here and there that say, well, you shouldn't be uh, scaring people. Look, you're scared if you're ignorant of what's right. coming. Right. Uh, really, what we're trying to do, we I think we've said almost every time we've talked about the end times, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And uh, absolutely nothing about what we're trying to share with you is designed to create fear or play off of fear. It's instead to equip us, to right. inform us about what's coming so we'll get spiritually prepared. Right. So you'll be the yellow house that's still standing Come when on. all the other houses get wiped out. Um, and so with, with that context, the wars and rumors of wars uh, that Jesus was talking about in that passage, it's in the same um, passage where he's talking about the labor pains. Um, and I've, I've never been pregnant. My wife had two kids. <laughs> My wife had, well, she had four kids total. We, we had two kids together. Uh, and labor pains, they come 
And at first, they're spaced far apart. And as you get closer to delivery, they get closer and closer together, and they get more intense, and they get harder. Hmm. Uh, you want to speak to that? You're talking about that like you know something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, based yes, on observation. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. And so what we see now, and, you know, we're, we're not going to set dates. Um, of course we're not, not trying to say dates right. and times. But what we're saying is the labor pains are getting closer and closer together. Right. The labor pains are getting more severe and they're getting more intense. Uh, and when we talk about war and rumors of war, um, specifically world war that's coming like the world has never seen. Right. And so as I was praying and kind of studying and preparing for this podcast, it, God kind of put it together for me in a way that I've never really thought of before. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, you know, if you like movies, um, sometimes there's movies where when you watch 10 minutes, you know, like, okay, I know exactly what's going to happen. I've seen this movie before. Right. I haven't seen this movie, but I've seen this movie. I know the plot, right? Right. I know how the plot's going to play out. Everybody always jokes about Hallmark movies at Christmas time. You all know that, you know, the small town girl is going to meet the big city guy. They're going to fall. They're going to hate <laughs> each other at first, and then they're going to fall in love at the end. And, right. You know, it's a Merry Christmas. Yes. Uh, so, so the those are predictable kind of plots. But the truth of the matter is what's going on in the world right now is extremely predictable because we've seen this movie before. Right. Uh, and, you know, a, a lot of the really good movie series, when there's more than one, there's usually a trilogy, right? Like Star Wars or, you know, Lord of the Rings or something. And the third one is always the one that ends everything. That's what wraps it all up. And we're heading towards the wrap up. And what we know is, you know, Jesus said, when war comes, be prepared, right? But this isn't the end. Because war right. is going to be the preface to the end. Right. War is going to be how Antichrist comes out of chaos and seizes power and rises, right? So right. that's really the, the context. I want you to understand the spirit in which this is given. So I want to talk to you about part one first. And we're going to go through these and you're going to see like the plot. So in part one, war breaks out somewhere else in the world that's not the United States. Right now, the vast majority of our viewers are in the United States, although we've been hearing a lot from people lately that they believe we're about to get released internationally. We have a lot of people that listen to our podcast. Uh, Chris, Even in maybe Pakistan. Put up a map. Even yeah. in Pakistan. It's, it's crazy. Um, we're going to put yeah. up the map from Podbean uh, and some of the other places so you can just see that uh, truly God is doing an international Amen. thing. But war uh, typically breaks out in the last a little over a century somewhere else in the world that's not the United States. The United States has some advantages that have kept us thus far yeah. relatively clean from war. We're surrounded on all sides by ocean and usually where the war starts is thousands of miles away across a long ocean. Uh, so this is how these wars have started. Uh, and so World War I was basically just a continuation of the same wars that had been fought for a thousand years in Europe. Uh, different kingdoms, different lines on the borders. I'm putting this map up now. You can see that there's the allied powers and there's the central powers and there's some neutral nations. Uh, and it started uh, July 28th, 2014. And one of the things that really interesting about this, in every single one of these wars, the world war starts long before the United States gets into it. So this was an unusual war. They began to call it the Great War because before in the past when wars happened, it was usually between one or two nations. Sometimes a third nation will be part of it. And they would fight each other and then they'd be done. But what happened in the Great War is it's like you threw a stone in a pond and the circles just started going out and spreading until it touched everything in the pond, right? And so it was an unusual war because of technology had advanced to the part. Here's the trenches and they had this trench warfare where there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of French on one side and British and on the other side, a hundred yards away is another trench full of Germans. And every once in a while they get up and they run towards each other and the machine guns mow them down. And then they do it the other way and goes back and forth. It's senseless killing. Mm. But it's kind of weird because it was the first really modern war. It was kind of like the intersection between leaving the past, the way warfare had been done for thousands of years. I'm putting this picture up. These are German soldiers on horseback with lances 
charging in the first world war, but there's machine guns and there's wow. tanks and right. there's planes oh, and there's, wow. you know, it's craziness, right? Uh, so is this an intersection of the wars? Every time mm. war happens, there's always an increase in technology because necessity right. is the mother of invention, right? If you want to yes. win the war, you want to survive, you're going to come up with new things. So World War I, just a mm. few of the things that came out of World War I that were relatively unknown before that. Submarines, tanks. I'm going to put these pictures up for you guys. Well, Chris is. Um, here's machine guns. And you see these guys here. They've got the machine guns and they also have on gas masks because mm. World War I was the first war in which they began to use uh, these toxins. Yeah. So you wanted to kill someone without a sword. You wanted to not even have to fire a bullet. You you send mustard gas or some other mm. chemical. It right. burns the inside of their eyes and nose wow. and throat. Uh, it burns their skin it, it can kill them without you ever having to put a bullet on them mm. um so this is a line of british soldiers who were blinded by mustard gas many 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 it was one of the first wars where there were so many disabled that still had all their limbs uh, but they've been crippled by the effects of war uh, and PTSD. It hadn't really been understood. These are some pictures of planes. This was the first war, the, the Great War, uh, the First World War, was the first war in which planes were used uh, as a means of warfare, uh, which, you know, all of a sudden in the last 125 years, everything's changed. Right. Before that, for thousands of years, war had been fought almost the same way. Here's a picture of some soldiers executing the enemy, uh, which there was all kinds of racial and ethnic hatreds taken out in war, which is what happens all the time. Uh, it's a horrible thing. And so for the first three years of the Great War, the First World War, the United States stayed out. And I'll show you this now. The, you're going to see these themes, right? Politicians in the United States make promises that no American soldiers will die. And they do it in an election year because they're up for election. So in 1914, this man who you're seeing now, Woodrow Wilson, was involved in a presidential election. Uh, and he stated that the United States would maintain its neutrality in the war in Europe. And he uh, because he knew what the temperature of the nation was. They didn't want to go send boys off across the ocean to go die for something that didn't matter to them and they didn't right. care about and right. they didn't affect them, right? Mm. And he said, we will be impartial in thought as well as in action. He said that in August of 1914, then he got elected the end of 1914. And so now you're going to see the next plot twist. But then things start to go badly. And so you see, honey, you see the little man falling down the stairs there, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, things started to go badly. And what went badly for the allied powers with whom the United States was aligned in thought, which was Britain and France, is that the Soviet revolution happened in 1917 before the Germans were fighting on two fronts. They were fighting in the West against the British and French. They were fighting on the East against the Russians. And then all the Russians said, you know what? Uh, why should I be fighting for the czar? I don't get any of this money. All the stuff we're fighting about doesn't matter to me. And so they went back and there was a revolution. Of course, horrible things came out of that. But you can see Vladimir Lenin there, um, you know, with the crowds of, of men. And most of them were soldiers who had returned from the front. So they just took their rifles that they'd been firing at the Germans and went back and started killing their own people. And there was, of course, a violent, uh, bloody revolution in Russia. Well, in the meantime, the Germans don't have to fight on two fronts anymore. So you see this, the Germans are charging. And what began to happen is they shifted all the, the German soldiers on the Eastern front and they sent them to the Western front. Uh, and when that happened, the war had been a stalemate for uh, about three years. And then all of a sudden, and so it's like tug of war. Y'all remember tug of war when you're at recess in elementary school, right? And there's, you know, a team over here, a team over there. And sometimes they'll be back and forth and nobody's really budging. And then at some point, something happens and somebody yanks it. And all of a sudden the line begins to move, right? And that's what happened. The stalemate got broken when the Germans rushed back to the Western Front. The line began to move. Well, so I'm going to show you this picture now. 
even though the politicians told the voters in the United States, we don't want to get involved in that. We're not going to send your sons to go die over there. There's a lot of Americans, rich globalist bankers, politicians, right. who wanted actually to be involved in the war. Because guess what? War makes money. Make money. Right. It kills right. poor yeah. people, but it makes money for rich Come people. On. And so some powerful people in America wanted in the war already. Come on. And then what happened? So here's the next plot twist. And I'm showing you this picture now. You're going to see this picture again. This guy right here. Most of you have no clue who he is. His name is Arthur Zimmerman. He was the foreign secretary of Germany uh, in dealing with Mexico. His job was to help the Germans instigate a war between Mexico mm. and the United States so the United States would be distracted with their southern border. My goodness. Wow. Think about that for a second. Those of you who've seen our prior podcast. Wow would instigate this mm, war so man. the American people would not be able to get involved in the war in Europe. Mm. And so this telegram was sent. It's called famously the Zimmerman telegram, and it was sent in code. Now, listen to how dumb this is. They sent the code from Germany to Mexico, right? The telegram. But they couldn't send it directly to Mexico because the Allies had cut the telegram cables that were under the ocean. And because of that, they had to send the telegram to the United States. <laughs> so they sent the telegram to the U.S. about Mexico starting a war with the U.S. The British had already cracked this code. They intercepted the message. And so here's, I'm putting up just a little bit of the, the message as interpreted from code to German to English. We intend to begin on the 1st of February, 1917 unrestricted submarine warfare, which meant they were going to go back to sinking American ships. Um, we shall endeavor in spite of this to keep the United States of America neutral. In the event of this not succeeding, we make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together. Generous financial support mm -hmm. and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The settlement is left to you. Mm -hmm. So this telegram was intercepted by the British. The British wanted the U.S. in the war because they knew that we would change the momentum of yeah. the war again. So they finally uh, figured out a way to disclose it to the American government. And then this happened. All the newspapers in the United States uh, started going crazy. Germany plots against the U.S. Um, and so before you knew it, in a few days, there was a declaration of war made. Ultimately, uh, I believe in April of 1917, they made a declaration of war in Congress. And the same President Woodrow Wilson, who said we're not going to get involved in the war in Europe, uh, led the nation to war in Europe. Okay. So, so now, so I don't, yeah, know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't want to interrupt because no. you're going good and I don't want you to lose your train of thought. And it's so, so great. But I had been jotting notes down right yeah. here because, because it's the same. Right. Yeah. And, and they're always learning ways to wage war and not be involved, especially, you know, the elites mm -hmm. that need to make money off of it and what have right. you. Right. So, so they study and they learn And I'm just going to say this quick, right now, the war is media. Yeah. Through media, through through information, yeah, information, pro propaganda. misinformation, propaganda. Yeah. Um, now there's media lies, right? You can't almost believe anything that you see, and right. you know you're getting all fired up about it. About uh, you know where's Ulinsky at? Um, over there in Ukraine, in yeah. the Ukraine, yeah. and what have you, and everybody's like, give them more money, right? Right. right. Um, and they got billions of dollars um from us, and then at one point, the Russian pipes were blown up. And they were saying Russia did it themselves. And, yeah. you know, there was a situation where Yulinsky was saying the USA needed to get in it and they needed to attack right now. And then we found out uh, what good thing we waited in. Right. You know what I mean? So right. so that's the thing is that, um, you know, when there are weapons of mass destruction and we went over there for that um, during the Bush time and then there was no weapons of mass destruction found. Right. Um, you know, so we have to be careful what we're believing because you're explaining it very well that it's happened over and over and there are people that have interests that can make big money off of war. Absolutely. So here, here's the, the 
she's talking about information. Here's the newspapers. U.S. at war with Germany. President signs resolution. Uh, now, all of a sudden, whereas before, three years earlier, the American people didn't want anything to do with the war. Now, they definitely want to war. Right. Men are signing up like crazy. Like, you know, right. I want to go fight for the British and so the French. So yeah. they got to make something happen. Yes. Right? Order out of chaos. Yes. That the people, the common person will be mad about to where the same people that were saying, we're not sending our sons, will sign up themselves now. Right. To go to war. Right. We got to make something look like it happens that the common person is mad at. Right. That they will be for war. Okay. Right. So... Here's the next plot twist. So now the USA gets into the war after all. And so the United States was a developing industrial power. We weren't considered a world power yet uh, till this point, but we had a huge population. We had huge agriculture production. We had huge industrial production. Uh, so we were a nation on the rise. The, the nation who had ruled the world basically for hundreds of years was Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And Great Britain uh, was, of course, involved in this war and had hundreds of thousands of their soldiers dying in this war. They're not nearly the size that we are. So all of a sudden, the Yanks, the Yankees come to rescue. So here's the soldiers marching. Uh, and of course, within a short period of time, we were really only in the war. By the time we got our soldiers there, really less than a year by the time we got a force on the ground. Uh, and to that point, they had really despised or looked down on American troops and war because we were a new country. They, there was no expectation that we were going to be uh, a good fighting force, but they quickly found out uh, that they were pretty tough. Yeah. And so it shifted the momentum of the war quickly. Uh, and ultimately, there was victory for the Allies, which included the United States. Now, I, I talked about the rich, fat bankers. I, I neglected to mention that part of the reason why they were anxious for the U.S. to get into the war, because at that point, it looked like the Allies were losing. And the banks in the United States had lent $7 billion dollars to Great Britain and France to assist in the war effort. And they were worried that if they lost, they wouldn't get their money back. Right. And of course, $7 billion mm. in 1917 wow. was hundreds of billions of dollars now. Right. Uh, so it was a huge sum of money at stake. So mm. uh, there's a lot to get through, but I just want to just kind of recap World War One because I want you to see incrementally how this is going to grow. This is a map that I'm putting up now, the number of deaths in World War I. Uh, 1.6 million in France, because that's where much of the war was fought. Over 2 million in Germany, because they're the nation that lost. Um, Austria-Hungary, 1.7 million. Great Britain, almost a million. Uh, so in total, there was about 20 million that died in the First World War, which was unheard of. That's why they, mm. and never in the history of the world had there been uh, wars with these kinds of casualties. Wow. And in addition to the 20 million, there was another 21 million wounded economic devastation wherever the war happened. And of course, you can see by looking at the map, where the war was fought is where the people die. Mm. That's important to remember. Okay. So I'm showing you this slide now and it says intermission. And this is like one of those uh, slides uh, from one of the old school black and white movies. So I was in theater uh, when I was in high school. And when we had one act play, whenever the scenes would change, they would close the curtains. And when right. the curtains are closed, they start moving props around and like changing the set and everybody's changing their costumes. Uh, and I want you to understand when the war is not happening, it doesn't mean that right. stuff isn't happening. There's it's stuff going on behind the curtain. It's just intermission, right? right. Wow. And so stuff is being prepared for the next act right. when that's happening. And it, I don't know. I was just praying about it last night. I really got kind of an understanding of that better. And so here I'm showing you this picture now. Everyone knows that's Adolf Hitler. And so when I talk about the stages being set behind the curtains between the acts for the next act, what I mean is the war, the settlement of the war was so harsh to Germany that there was economic devastation. And Germany to this point had always been a very, very rich, prosperous nation. And there was such anger among the German people about the economic devastation and about the embarrassment and the shame of being defeated in war. Like we, it's hard for us to understand France and Germany 
like 65 or 70 percent of all the military age males, which is between 15 years old and 50 years old, fought in those wars. So almost every man had been in the war in some way. And so there was such anger that the conditions were ripe for this man that you see, Adolf Hitler, to come to power and assume total control. Because he said, I am going to reverse the shame and the disgrace and the humiliation. We're going to get vengeance uh, on the ones who did this to us. So this is what was happening behind the scenes. So now we go to scene two or part two. Uh, Once again, we're here in the United States minding our own business. We've got economic boom in the 20s. We've got the Great Depression in the 30s. No one's thinking about Europe. In fact, because uh, about... Let's see, approximately 120,000 Americans died fighting in the First World War, which was a small percentage of our population, but is a lot of people. Americans wanted nothing to do with war. And once again, war breaks out in Europe. And it didn't really start in 1939. It had been preparing for quite some time before that. But on September 1st, 1939, Hitler's army uh, rushed across the boundary line into Poland. And that immediately triggered some defense pacts with Great Britain and France. And all of a sudden now, Germany is now at war again with Great Britain and France. So it's basically the same people that were fighting before, Mm. you know, and now it's, um, you know, 20 years later, a little over 20 years later. So this war's even bigger than the last one because I'm putting up this slide. At the same time, there was an empire growing in the East. China, it it was uh, not... China like it is now. It was Japan at that time. Japan had started invading all the territories around it, seizing islands, trying to grow their economy. It's always about the economy, right? Right. And so at the very beginning of the war, the Germans were uh, kicking butt. I mean, there. here's a picture of a Nazi soldier. They had what they called Blitzkrieg, which when translated means lightning war. And that's the way they did it. They rushed tanks. They had hundreds of planes and bombers that they sent. And they immediately started um, taking over every country. Mm. It, there's an interesting story that's a sermon I used to preach. There was what was called the Maginot Line. The French, French had spent years and millions of dollars and all this fortifications and bunkers to defend their border from Germany because of the last war. They forgot about the front door. So the Germans just went around the concrete bunker They went around the defenses and they rushed into France and within a few weeks, they took out one of the world's powers, supposedly completely destroyed it. So here's some of the technological advancements um, of World War II. For the first time ever, there were rockets. The Germans developed rockets that they fired uh, to great effect against Britain. There were cruise missiles in World War II, which is kind of shocking. Um, Most people don't realize they were in the Second World War. Jet fighters, and had the Germans used them right, it possibly could have changed the outcome of the war. And then, of course, the development of atomic weapons at the end of the war by the United States, which led to the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima uh, and ultimately ended the war. And here's the devastation caused by a nuclear bomb. So here we are back to our same plot. Politicians make promises that no American soldiers will die in an election year, right? And here is uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And in a presidential election year, 1940, uh, the Republican nominee was Wendell Wilkie. And he was telling everybody, hey, FDR is going to get your boys into this war and they're going to be bringing them home in, in pine boxes. Your sons are going to die overseas. You can't elect Wilson. You've got to elect me. And Wilson, I mean, Franklin Roosevelt said, I said Wilson, I meant Roosevelt. Roosevelt said, I have said this before, but I shall say it again and again and again. Your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. He just didn't say that if the United States got attacked, it wouldn't be a foreign war anymore. Okay. And then the boys would be sent. Right. So, so then things start to go badly. Here's the plot twist again. What started to go badly? Well, the Germans stormed through Uh, Holland and France, they took Poland, they were attacking Russia at the time, it looked like they might even take out the Soviet Union. Uh, They started uh, bombing 
London in the Battle of Britain. Uh, here's one of their bombers over the city of London. Here's the devastation. Here's here's a guy de- delivering milk in the rubble of the city. Mm. Crazy. This is what was left of of most of London. Even I got to go to London. You see St. Uh, Peter's Cathedral uh, there. Actually, that that's St. Paul's. St. Peter's is in Rome. Uh, there's the cathedral, and it was actually hit by bombs as well. It had been built hundreds of years before. It was total devastation, mm. total devastation in London. People were uh, sleeping in the subway, um, you know, uh, stations because it wasn't safe to be in their house. Wow. So while all this is going on, some really powerful people in America actually want America in the war. Even the politicians are telling the people, no, we're not going to get your sons into this. There were some bankers in New York City that had lent billions of dollars. Now, this time, it's $30 billion, which is hundreds of billions of dollars in today's money to the allies. And they were worried that they weren't going to get their money back. Mm. So something happens. Then this happens. Japan attacked Pearl Harbor December 7th, 1941. There's a lot of people who believe that the United States knew that they were going to attack and we didn't take the proper steps to warn the fleet in Pearl Harbor. Wow. Many historians believe that because of the steps that the United States was taking against Japan, meaning we were cutting them off from their gas supply, they had no gasoline supplies of their own, they didn't produce gasoline, that they really had no choice but to fight this offensive war. So we kind of like baited each other into it. And now all of a sudden, here's Pearl Harbor on fire. Here's Battleship Row, uh, the USS Arizona that my wife and I got to go to the memorial for uh, some years ago. Uh, 3,000 Americans died approximately that Sunday morning. Nobody was at their battle stations. Nobody was ready. And Franklin Mm -hmm. Delano Roosevelt said yesterday, December 7th, 1941, 1941, a day which will live in infamy. This is what Eve was talking about. In, in the United States of America United was suddenly States and deliberately America attacked by naval and air forces and of the Empire of Japan. So he went to Congress, and of out of Empire. Congress, there was only one vote against. Everyone was in favor. Let's go to war. And hundreds and hundreds of thousands of men went to the recruiting stations the next day to sign up to volunteer for the Army, which is exactly what Eve was talking about. So now the USA gets into the war after all. And so, same story, just like Act 1, Act 2 is the same. The United States gets in, uh, and it took a minute, especially in the Pacific, but the United States, by this time, was an industrial powerhouse, had a, was able to field a huge army. We turned all of our factories into producing weapons of war, and within um, you know a few short years, really, we turned the tide of the war uh, which ultimately we won in Europe and in Asia. Here's the uh, guys heading for the beach on D-Day, June 6, 1944. This is one of the craziest, coolest battle uh, combat photos I've ever seen. He's a Marine or an Army soldier being carried on the back of one of his comrades because he's injured and he's still firing his handgun. Mm, wow. I love that picture. It's a great picture of a warrior, isn't it? Yeah. The United States Air Force was dominant. Uh, began to bomb Japan, uh, bombed the heck out of, of, of Germany and just completely obliter- obliterated uh, many cities in Germany. Uh, here's some of the bombers dropping their bombs. The United States Navy um, was able to exercise dominance in the Pacific. Here's General MacArthur waiting ashore the Philippines. He said, I shall return. And he said, I have returned. And there's the Marines raising the flag over Mount Siribachi on Iwo Jima. So, um, you know, it's interesting because the United States, just like the last time, you got West and the East, right? The United States and Great Britain and France were coming from the West. The Soviet Union, you can see in this map, was coming from the East, and they were both headed towards Germany to wipe out the Nazis. And because of just geography and some other things that happened uh, militarily, the Soviets actually got to Berlin first. Here's the Soviet army raising the Soviet flag over a building in Berlin, which represented ultimately the victory. Uh, Hitler uh, killed himself and eventually the Nazis capitulated a few days later. Here's uh, the emperor's people uh, in Japan surrendering on the USS Missouri. Um, so that ended the war in the Pacific, and 
here's the victory parade where the guy kissed the lady is one of the most famous photographs ever taken. Hundreds of thousands of Americans died um, in the Second World War. There were 400,000 that died. Um, there were hundreds of thousands more that were wounded. But all over the world, the total deaths was a shocking increase over the First World War. You can see in this graphic that we put up, the Soviet Union, 26 million people died. Wow. And most of those were civilians. They weren't military. It was mothers and sons and children and the old. Those were the people that died. Some of these deaths were from starvation because whenever there's war, there's always economic deprivation. Mm. Uh, it was 13% of their total population. Wow. China, 15 to 20 million died, which was 3 to 4% of their population. Germany, much smaller country, 7 million died, almost 10%. The United States lost 419,000, which was less than 1% of our population at the time. Why? Because the war wasn't fought on our shores. Mm -hmm. The war was fought overseas. So of all those deaths, almost all of them were military age males that were in the army in the fight. Huh. Like these other, like the Soviet Union, we didn't have millions right. of civilians dying. So there's a little map with the percentages and you can see once again, wherever the war gets fought, that's where people die. So now we're at intermission again. Intermission. And this time they're changing scenes behind um, the curtains. And it was crazy because even before... We signed the papers and we ended the war. The United States and the Soviets were already talking about, you know who the next war is. We knew it was them. They knew it was us. Like the generals, in fact, some of the generals, um, one of the uh, famous ones is General Patton. Uh, he was famous for telling his superiors, look, we need to go ahead and we need to go ahead and fight the Soviets now. Because if we don't, they're going to become a problem. And of course, he got squelched because they were like, well, we were allies. We can't do that. Uh, but right away, we knew that it was going to be us against them. And so here's the picture of the American soldiers and the Russian soldiers shaking hands uh, in Berlin. And within a few years, we were staring across fences at each other with barbed wire and weapons pointed at each other. Mm. Right away, it became an arms race uh, and the Cold War uh, started. And so the time between the First World War and the Second World War is a little over 20 years. The time after the Second World War ended in 1945, the Cold War kind of delayed the next world war. But behind the scenes, this stuff is happening, mm. right? So now we're at part three, act three. War breaks out somewhere else in the world. And uh, it was on February 24th, 2022, that Putin's army from Russia invaded Ukraine which was not a member of NATO, but what is allied with the West. Uh, and so ever since then, we have had the danger really of a third world war breaking out. Here's Putin's tanks headed towards uh, Ukraine. Here's what's going on so far. In this war, there's been about 30,000 civilian casualties. Uh, the combined total of fighters killed on both sides is over half a million now. And, here is what is going on politically. This is a map of NATO. So slowly NATO has grown and grown and grown. And it, because of the invasion of Ukraine, new members that were never members before, Sweden and Finland, are now joining NATO. And it is making Putin extremely nervous. He's beginning to say, even in the last week or two, things that are scary for people who are worried about war coming. <laughs> Ну, с военно-технической точки зрения мы, конечно, готовы. Они у нас постоянно находятся, постоянно находятся в состоянии боевой готовности. Это первое. А второе, и это тоже вообще признанная вещь, наша триада, ядерная триада, она является более современной, чем любая другая триада. А таких триад только... Вот у нас, да, американцы, на самом деле. И, и мы здесь продвинулись гораздо больше. У нас она, она более современная. So here's the next thing. Politicians in America make promises that no American soldiers are going to die. And they say that in election year. 
Joe Biden did the State of the Union address last week. The first thing he talked about in the State of the Union for the United States of America was the war in Ukraine. Because right now it's an election year and nobody on either side wants to give money for more arms. We've already given them over $75 billion to Ukraine, uh, much of which has been proven to have been spent badly for political corruption and other things. And yet, even though no one wants to do it and politicians on both sides will not approve new arms sales and new new, uh, aid, the first thing he talked about in the State of the Union is, of course, Ukraine, and we need to give them money, and we need to give them stuff. And so I'm going to play right, have Chris play right now this little short video clip of Biden talking about the war in Ukraine. We will not fight the Third World War in Ukraine. Putin's war against Ukraine was never going to be a victory. Democrats are rising to meet the moment, relying, r- rallying the world on the side of peace and security. We're showing the strength, and we'll never falter. But look, The idea, the idea that we're going to send in offensive equipment and have planes and tanks and trains uh, going in with American pilots and American crews, just understand, and uh, don't kid yourself, no matter what you all say, that's called World War III, okay? But even though supposedly the politicians don't want us to be in war and they're telling all the voters they don't want us to be in a war, there's some powerful people in America that want to be in the war. And some of them are in Congress, and they talk about it openly. The president of France, Emmanuel Macron, just said in a couple of weeks ago that we can't rule out anything. All options should be on the table, including military options, to help Ukraine not lose this war. The United States, as we talked about before, is in NATO. So if any NATO member begins to get in a fight with Russia, then it probably is going to trigger Article 5, which means the United States has to fight once again across the ocean for another country. And then things start to go badly. Here's your plot twist again. What's going badly? The tug of war has been a stalemate for almost a year now. Ukraine's not advancing really. Russia hasn't been advancing. But now all of a sudden, Russia's beginning to advance. Uh, They just took a city that I can't pronounce, Advi, Ad, Ad, Spell it. I'll never, Avidka. A-V-D-I-I-V-K-A. Say it, Chris. Avidka. Avidka. So they've been fighting over this city for months, and finally Russia just took it uh, last week. And so uh, the Ukrainians are retreating in that area. Um, people think that the Ukrainian army is about tapped out because it's a relatively small country. It's right. not anywhere near as big as Russia. They've lost hundreds of thousands of their military age males to the war. So, so then this happens, right? So that something's going to happen. I'm just, we've seen the movie before now twice. And so I'm putting up this little graphic that says you are here. You know, sometimes you look at a map and they'll say you are here. This is where we are right now. Where we are is... We're, we've progressed through the beginning stages of the war across the ocean. The United States has not been drawn in yet. But twice before, we've seen it happen that something happens. And what is it? I don't know. I cannot predict what possibly could happen that would draw the United States in. But I do know that in the past, both times, it's been something that was so bad that made the United States people demand to get in the war. Right. Not demand to not get in the war. They demand to get in the war. They insist on the war. Right. And I am extremely concerned being a student of history and also knowing what the word of God says about where this is all headed, that we are here and that something is going to be happening in the near future. So then the USA will get involved after all. And then you'll see these guys. You'll see United States military fighting with NATO in Europe. But here's the problem. Before, when we had World War, you you only had one nation. It was only at the very end have nuclear weapons. And I had a thought. Like the United States knew it was going to win the war. We didn't fight. We didn't drop nuclear bombs on Japan to make sure we won the war. We knew we were going to win. It was already basically over. Japan hadn't surrendered yet. The reason why they state that they dropped the bomb was to save a million U.S. servicemen's lives because if we'd had to invade Japan, 
they estimate that they would have fought every inch of the way and that they would have millions uh, or hundreds of thousands of Americans would have died. So they did it to save American lives. Can you imagine when you have multiple nuclear powers now, and I'll put up this map that shows how many warheads and how many countries have nuclear weapons now. If any of these powers that gives involved in a great war again feels like it's losing, do you really believe that any of these nations with nuclear warheads are not going to fire them right. to win the war and to save their people? So this is a projection of what it would look like. If you look at that image, it would show uh, progressively what would happen with nuclear warheads uh, if we entered into another world war between nuclear powers. And it shows the trajectory and the path of hundreds and hundreds of nuclear missiles, which some of which would be fired from submarines, some dropped from planes, and some fired cruise missiles. So it is a terrifying time in this last slide I'm putting up because I really believe that it's not a question of if this war is going to happen, it's right. when. It's not a question of if, it's how will it get sparked. But the end result of it will be this man, the Antichrist, who's going to be revealed to be um, the enemy himself trying to take well, control. Well, he will rise up as a peacemaker and oh, one that absolutely. has all the answers right. for all the countries and the whole world. Right. Um, and then, you know, it'll unite as one world government, one world religion, one world so that it doesn't happen ever again. Um, you know, and in the meantime, with all this going on, uh, America is in crisis yes. with the migrant situation alone. And, and I hope that we have time. I'm going to have Chris put up a video um, that I just saw myself in just Colorado mm -hmm. of what's going on there. And that's just one place. This is happening all over the United States. It is not on the news. You are not seeing it. But um, crisis has been created in America and sleeper cells are all over America. And you saw the video where military age uh, Chinese are coming in the border of Mexico, as well as many other nations that do not like us. And so um, there's so much going on. And as my husband said, uh, you know, there, there are a few writers that, that don't, don't want to hear about the end times, um, you know, but we need to know and be informed of what's going on and how it applies biblically and where we're at in the times. And for the number one thing to prepare spiritually. Right. Yes. Because God is our insurance. There is nowhere you go, well, where do I move? There's nowhere to move. There's nowhere to hide of what's coming. There, there's nowhere to right. hide except for hidden in the Lord, right? right? And Amen. so wherever you are, if you are in the Lord, that is your hiding place. That is your protection. Your purpose is your insurance. If you are doing the will of God and he's got a call on your life and you're fulfilling it and you're obeying him, then he's gonna insure you yeah. and he's gonna protect you wherever you're at. If everyone else falls around you at thousand at your yeah, side and 10,000 at your right hand. It will not come nigh you because, yeah. because the Bible says so, right? Because the word of God says so. And so that's why we're sharing the things with you. And um, I know many do enjoy knowing what's going on. So I, are you got anything else? Or? I'm just going to read this scripture that God gave me earlier. Romans 5, 1, it says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace Come on. with God. We have peace Amen. with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, yes. has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where yes. we now stand and we confidently yeah. be confident and joyfully Come on. be joyful. Look forward to sharing God's glory. It's like, you know, the rich and the uh, government elite have these bunkers and everything that they're going to go to whenever there's right. a, a, a war, but God is our bunker. That's where we're going to go. He's well, our refuge. And, and, and you our know, safety. that's why God is raising up these soldiers and warriors behind bars because you know how to fight. Come on. And you're going to yeah. be out there ministering to people that, that are dying. You're going to be out there ministering to people in, in dangerous situations, but you've already been there. And so while they're running away from Goliath, we're little David running towards Come him on, saying, yeah. I'm about to cut your head right. off. Come on. And so that's what God is doing. And that's why he's called these warriors in the last day. There's bigger purpose. There's purpose to your life. Yes. And, and God is preparing you right now for everything that's coming so that nothing surprises you and nothing scares you. Right. And you are ready, if it need be, to even give your life in this 
spreading of the gospel and the war against the Come real on. enemy who is the devil. Right. You know? So um, we're going to pray out. And yeah. I think it was really great. And we will keep you updated as much as possible. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, for all that you have already done and you are doing. And you are raising up soldiers and warriors in the army of the Lord. That, God, you are preparing them, Father. That you are, Father, you're the shield about them, Lord. Father, you're the glory, God, that surrounds us. And, Father, God, you go before us. You're our rear guard. We have nothing to fear because we have you. And so, Father, God, we go into this battle spiritually, Father, that we inform everybody around us right now, Lord, for what you're preparing us for in the future as we take these steps in that direction, Lord God. I ask that you anoint them from their head to their feet. I ask that you unite this body of Christ, Father, so that we would work as one body towards you, for you, God, in you and through you. And Father, we thank you for all that you have done and you are perfecting and you are finishing in us. In Jesus' name, amen. This is happening today in the city of Denver, Colorado. Migrant shelters are closing down and the migrants are being let out into the streets. In Denver, they've spent close to $57 million sheltering, feeding, providing every necessity for these migrants to survive in America. They cannot get work permits, therefore they don't know what to do. They're just hanging out during the day. I've been there, I've seen it. We've talked to hundreds of migrants in the city of Denver, Colorado and they're stuck. Now the governor and the mayor, the mayor of Denver is asking Denver residents if they have any space in their house to let these migrants come and live with them. Can you imagine that? Let these migrants come and live with them so that they can have somewhere to go. Before they were put into hotels, they were all living outside on the streets in migrant shelters, but it became too cold. Therefore, they had to go into these hotels and these shelters. And now Denver is running out of money and they're saying we cannot keep doing this. After I went to Denver, I had several people reach out to me, tell me where to go to talk to migrants, where to go and see them. One person said, at a Home Depot, he gave me the direct address. I will not give that to you, but he said that the Venezuelan men were prostituting out their wives for $20 an hour so that that, that was some way that they could make money. Imagine doing that. But imagine being a president that has let over 7 million illegals enter into America and every day it just keeps on happening. We'll see if he dresses it at the State of the Union tonight, but I doubt he will. But if you live in Denver, Colorado, that is what is going on too.